Hello and welcome to the museum in Washington, D.C. We're here in the night studio for the first talk show of its kind, protecting the vulnerable tuberculosis and HIV in women and children. My name is Jean Meserve, and during this next hour, you'll hear from tuberculosis patients, women living with HIV, doctors, public health specialists, advocates, and policymakers. Some will be here on stage with me, others will be in our studio audience, and we'd also like to welcome participation from our online audience around the world. You can join us at hashtag TB Live. Together, we hope to learn how to save some lives. 1.4 million people around the world died from tuberculosis in 2010, even though tuberculosis is a treatable disease. Joining me on stage to talk about this problem is Jerry Elsden, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent's ambassador for tuberculosis. Those of you who have spent time in South Africa might recognize Jerry as a television host there. From Uganda, Alice Beringi, who is living with HIV and overcame tuberculosis. She is helping young people fight the stigma of this co-infection in her country. Dr. Jennifer Furin, who has worked with tuberculosis patients among the HIV-positive population in Africa. Dr. Furin is affiliated with Case Western Reserve University in Ohio. And Carrie Kassin from South Africa's version of Sesame Street. And Carrie brings with her a special guest able to communicate with young people far more effectively than adults can. Jerry, I want to start with you. First, give us the fundamentals on what TB really is. Well, what we need to know is that it's not a virus, it's a bacteria, that it is airborne, um, and that uh, it's been around for a very long time, even though it is preventable and it is curable. And those are the most important bits of information that we need to get out about. And you have had your personal experience with us. Tell us about that. I have had a personal experience. I was at the height of my television career in South Africa when I was attempting to conceive a child uh, with my husband. And it was at that time, going through fertility treatment, one doctor after the other, that we actually uh, were asked to do a womb biopsy. And in doing the biopsy, we actually discovered that the, that the, the TB bacteria was sitting in the lining of the womb. Now, this Most people think of TB and think lungs. Precisely what they call pulmonary TB. And here I was sitting with it in my womb of all places. So I started doing my research, um, looked for the best treatments. Uh, but also, of course, that big question, how did I pick up TB? Now, Sure, how did the celebrity pick up TB? But the fact is, I'm just an ordinary South African. I grew up in a township like so many South Africans. And uh, I could have picked it up going to school on the bus um, one day when I was 12 or, or any other activity for that matter. Because it's everywhere. It is every, everywhere, and, and I think it's important to note that it is airborne. Now, yes, um, mine didn't lodge itself in the lungs. I couldn't cough it out and impact someone else. However, it was doing um, its own detrimental uh, harm within my womb. Now, Alice, you're a survivor on two fronts. You're HIV positive, and then you contracted tuberculosis. Yeah. Do you have any idea how you got the disease? When I got HIV, I decided to start staying with my friend who was HIV positive too because I was scared of going back home. So in the process, this friend of mine also had TB and I, I, at first we didn't know and kind of a long story on how they kept on doing so many tests and they realized later at a late stage that he had TB of the spinal cord and TB of the, of the lungs. So after some time, I also started having the net sweats, joint pain, and I started coughing. Then I went to the hospital. It was not easy to diagnose TB, I, that I had TB, bearing in mind I, had, I was on treatment. So they did so many tests until when they did a skin test and I realized I was having TB. Your friend from whom you got TB, you said it took years and years for doctors to figure out yes. that she had the disease. Is yes. that right? Yes. Why? I think because she was on HIV treatment, I've heard that when people live with HIV, it's difficult to detect that, that they have TB. It's difficult to detect the TB virus in them. So this person had stayed for, with nitrous sweats for two years and I was, the, the doctors were not recognizing and they were not detecting that TB. And the person was coming ill at the extent that for one year her CD4 count was 19. And as we talk now, when she started on TB treatment, she's now in 300. The TB cells is 300. So you were HIV positive? Yes. 
But did you feel an even greater stigma once you contracted TB? Yes, I knew I was HIV positive and I'd gone through a lot with it. But when it came to TB, I thought I was going to die. Because first I had self-stigma in me and I was so scared. Because people fear TB more than HIV. They feel like you can get it anyway. Whether you because it's in, the air. it's in the air. So people fear that the stigma is too much and it's stronger than when you have HIV. Because you know, no one can easily know. But with TB, coughing and so many things, people can easily know that you have TB. Dr. Fern, you have been on the front lines fighting this disease. Why haven't we made more progress? You know, it's a really good question. And I think the answer is the medical community and the public health community have been far too complacent in how we approach tuberculosis. When you hear the story of Alice's friend, it's a story that a lot of people can tell because the way we diagnose tuberculosis in most places is relying on a test that's over 100 years old. And it's a test that's not effective in people who have HIV. So even though we know how to cure this disease, no one should die of tuberculosis. To hear 1.4 million is horrifying. But they're dying because we're relying on old and outdated tools. We're relying on medications that aren't terribly effective. And it's time to change that. Are there new diagnostic tools available that simply haven't been disseminated to Africa, to India, to other places where this disease is yes, prevalent? Yes, absolutely. There are some wonderful new diagnostic tests that can diagnose TB and drug-resistant TB within a matter of two hours. We have wonderful machines like that here in the U.S. where we have almost no TB. And in places where TB is rampant, people often say those countries are too poor to afford these tests. So rather than you know, try to lower the price or make it more affordable, people simply deny these tests to patients living in Uganda and South Africa. I have to ask, though, how much of it is simply political will? Because then we have South Africa. I'm assuming the machine you're talking about is gene expert. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, is one of them. Uh, we launched it in South Africa a, a year and a half, two years ago. Two, yeah, two TB days ago. And you know what? The fact is that my government simply said we cannot afford to be number four on on the list of high burden countries with TB anymore. Why, when a population is only this, uh, is only 49 million, do we have such a high rate of TB? And so we, we took the plunge and the financial plunge and we, we do have the machines and it has made a, a difference to our statistics. So I'm wondering how much of this is political will? I think a great deal of it is political will, but it's also how we think about the costs of something. So the cost of someone having to tuberculosis and not being treated is huge. They're spreading it in the community, etc. But no one has to pay for that. But they do have to pay for the tests. And they'll say, oh, it costs this much money per test. And so people don't think about the cost of inaction. But inaction is what is leading to the situation we're in now. So we talk about the co-infection of HIV and tuberculosis. How prevalent is it? And why is it then when someone is introduced to the healthcare system, uh, to be tested for HIV, they aren't automatically tested for tuberculosis. So they should be, is the answer. Unfortunately, the way most services are set up, the HIV doctors and nurses are here, the TB doctors and nurses are here, and rather than make it easy for the patient by providing integrated care, the HIV doctors say, go see the TB doctors, etc. Huge amount of infection goes on when we're doing that to people, and it's hard for the patients. Um, so. It's, uh, it's very complicated. A lot of the patients are children. Yes. Are there some special challenges in treating TB in kids? Absolutely. Um, you know, we don't even know how many numbers there are of children because in all the global statistics on TB, children under the age of 15 are not even included. Um, so we don't actually know. We estimate there's probably about half a million children who have tuberculosis. Why are they not included? Because they say it's too difficult for them to cough um, and that they can't give a proper sample. So they're not included in that. But most children over the age of eight can cough pretty well. Um, and it's relatively straightforward to make a diagnosis if the child can produce sputum. What about the medical regime for kids? Yeah, the medical regimen is really tough because all of the tablets are designed for adults. Um, so we have only two child-friendly formulations of the medications. So we give children tablets that then need to be crushed up. They have to take them you know, with a huge amount of liquid. It's a lot of work for them. It's a lot of work for their parents. And these drugs have to be taken over a long period of time, A minimum correct? of six months. Yeah, you know all about that, Jerry. Oh, do I not know all about that? And of course, so does Alice. <laughs> right. I mean, we we yeah. both, you went I on an eight-month eight treatment. Month. Yeah. 
I did a nine-month treatment before I did my next womb biopsy. And for drug-resistance TB, it's the course is... Yeah. It's 24 months. Two years. And if you think about it, drug-resistant TB is more difficult to treat, and we have to give a daily injection. Um, the injections are very painful, and you can only imagine a child whose skin and bones from malnutrition and having TB, the pain they go through to get an injection like that every single day for at least six months. We need better medication. It, it's just absolutely necessary. Well, why hasn't progress been made? If this disease is so prevalent, there obviously is a demand for these drugs. Mm -hmm. Why haven't they been formulated? Well, I think there's two reasons. A lot of it goes back to what Jerry was saying about political will. But we have to think about the pharmaceutical companies that make drugs, they do need or want to make money. And you're not going to make money off tuberculosis. It's not going to be your shining multi-billion dollar drug because most people who get it can't pay. Well, governments will pay for it to some degree. To some degree. But I have to tell you, governments, they, they also put stigma on the TB patients. It's not like they're running around to find them and help them and treat them. Many countries will deny that they have a problem with tuberculosis. And these people are sort of shoved under the rug. Jerry, you're laughing at I'm that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm digging a little because when I try to find a treatment center, once I, I had, um, thankfully, have I have in my country access to the internet and information and I was able to make some calls and find a treatment center, I was living five minutes away from a clinic that had no banner up that said, we treat TB here, or in fact that we were a clinic. It said, that it was a library, and behind the library, I had to walk through a uh, overgrown little path to find the clinic, and when I got there, there were 177 people ahead of me at 6 a.m. in the morning. Wow. Okay, so, so let's just be honest. Yes, the political will is there, but are we not perhaps hiding the real problem here? And the real problem here is, who is listening to the sufferer? How does the sufferer feel uh, about, about being the one who needs to walk behind the library and in through a passage um, to find a building that may or may not be their treatment center? And it's no different whether you're an HIV um, AIDS uh, uh, individual who needs to seek treatment or if you're a TB uh, person seeking treatment. HIV has become very prominent in the public consciousness, in part because there are a lot of celebrities who speak out about the disease. Uh, is TB different in the sense that it's the more marginalized people who are impacted by the disease? Poverty is about the more marginalized individuals in a society, but somehow Certainly. for a celebrity to put their name behind um, uh, poverty and, and, and hunger alleviation seems sexier than putting their name behind tuberculosis. Um, I, and I don't know why. Alice, I'm wondering if for women it's particularly difficult um, to cope with this disease, in part because in many cases women are the breadwinner, you're taking care of the children, uh, you have many other functions which would make it difficult uh, for you to take a time out to get treatment for this illness. Is that a problem? It's a very big problem. Personally, I was taking care of my young sister. I had to send her away because I, I didn't want her to conduct that, that, that TB disease. But at the same time, in the hospital, most of the people like who've been lining, lining with the mainly women. Men usually do hide, and in my country, some of them send their women to go and pick their drugs. They don't go to pick drugs for themselves. If you don't bring me drugs, you, we share. Or you don't take and I take. And a lot of, th so many things have been taking around, uh, around, around that. But still, I wanted to add to what she was saying. Accessing treatment was difficult for me. I had to get through a friend. TB, they said TB is free, but it's not free of charge. So I had to go through a friend to show me someone can get me those treatment, the, those drugs. I was not working and I needed it, and I needed to get free. I didn't need to get access to free TB treatment. Even testing, they said treatment, well, testing for TB is free, but I had to pay money for me in order to be worked on on time. Well, I have the three of you here who have such great experience with this. If you were to say the, the top three most important things that must be done to address this issue, what, what do you think they would be? Dr. Fern, let's start with you. I think we need to prioritize tuberculosis as a disease that is interesting scientifically and from a moral and human point of view, we, we can't stop ignoring this epidemic. When you look at HIV, you know, 30 years ago we didn't really know about HIV and now we have great tests, great drugs, the science is exciting. When you look at tuberculosis, not a lot of people are, they, we, they keep saying we have to just do it the old way and the old way is the best we've got. So we really need 
people to get excited about this and to be deeply moved by the stories these women are sharing. And you know, in my job, I'm fortunate to speak with lots of women and children and tuberculosis patients, and they all tell a similar horrible story. And we need to be upset by that. We need to be bothered by that. And we really need to get up and, and do the work. Jerry, do you get a little applause here from our audience <laughs> here? Yes. Alice? Alice, what do you think would be the most important thing to do to address the issue? I think they need to make sure that all services, TBHIV services, are free of charge and they should integrate. Personally, I work with a community based organization, and what we've been doing is to advocate for integration of TB and HIV. So that when you go for a TB test, you are done. I mean, for HIV tests, they do that TB. Like what they are doing for to pregnant mothers, they when you come for antenatal, they test for HIV. They should add TB on that also. Jerry, yeah. your top suggestion? Well. For me, I'm going to have to agree with, with Alice, it is the integration. For a very long time, the TB community has included uh, HIV testing as part of what they do. We need the HIV community to say that too many of uh, people living with HIV are dying of tuberculosis. It is time that we stand up and we do something about TB uh, because we are here to support that the community in, in, in seeing to it that, we, the, we, that every country reaches its millennium goals and this certainly is a way to, to do it. So uh, bringing together the services, understanding the patient um, and the needs of the patient is very important and working it, doing it together, only together are we going to do this. Carrie, I don't mean to have left no, you out of this conversation. I <laughs> want to talk all. now about the very important work that your organization mm -hmm. is doing to try and educate children in particular mm -hmm. about HIV. Yeah, HIV has been our focus uh, in South Africa for Takalani Sesame, which is obviously the South African version of Sesame Street. We've been there for over 10 years and, you know, almost immediately we knew that we had to start talking about HIV and AIDS. This wasn't a request, it was, we need to get it done. And we did. Um, and, you know, we've developed a curriculum that really speaks at a very basic level to children. Our talk target audience is three to seven year olds. And we really want to provide that vocabulary that allows them to talk and talk about HIV in a very, very basic manner. So we look at issues of destigmatization, which, you know, Alice also mentioned was an issue, um, humanization of the disease, so that, you know, we present a picture that's not about a disease, it's about people. And I think that's what's really important. Out of this, we've also, well, I brought a little friend, let me just put it to you that way. If I can find her, Cami, are you here? Um, Cami? What? Cami? Oh, did I hear my name? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Cami. <laughs> Hi. So these are all our guests, and I wanted you to, I wanted them to meet you. Um, so you can tell them a little bit about yourself. Oh, well, um, I, I was born to a mum who had HIV, and um, I, I got it from her. And after she died, I went to live in Taklani Sesame. Mm -hmm. And when I went to school, the children had all known that I am HIV positive. So they were scared to sit next to me or to share their lunch with me. Mm -hmm. And so I felt very, very alone. But then um, some other friends who were more grown up came to school with me and they told the children that they could not catch HIV just from sitting next to me. Right, and just by being your friend. That's right. Yeah. So, so now I have many, many friends mm -hmm. and, and uh, we all play together and life is much better. Good. And Cammie, Cammie how, do you, how do you take care of yourself? Well, I go to the doctor and the nurses and I, I get checkups and then um, I eat lots of fruits and vegetables and, and they make me stronger and big. And, and lots of exercise, exercise too. Exercise. Oh, yes, she I love loves, to play yeah. soccer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Huge soccer fan. We're South African, so. Yes. Yes. Exactly. Yes, you know. and I, <laughs> exactly. I, I work in the garden. I like, I like to plant fruits and vegetables, oh, too. Yes. And those friends, you said, who were scared of you at first because you were HIV positive? Yes. They've come around now and they oh, include yes, you yes. in games. It's, and oh, yes, yes, yes. We, we play together and uh, they even share their sandwiches with me now which is good because I try different kinds of food. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it is much, much better, but it's because they did not know enough about HIV. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Cammie, thanks for joining us. I know we want to talk to you a little bit later, but you okay. have some other things to do, so right. we'll so let you I go do that. I will be back. I, see, I will see you a little later. But okay. thank you for listening to me. Oh, okay. we're thrilled to have you with us, Cammie. Bye-bye. <laughs> thanks Bye -bye. so much. <laughs> And that's the special guest we talked about who has a way with kids that <laughs> none of us, special. much as we might try, <laughs> quite have. I want to go to the studio audience right now. Regan Hoffman is with us. Regan is editor-in-chief of Paws Magazine and Paws.com. The website and magazine are dedicated to those living with AIDS. Uh, thank you so much for coming in. Regan, the HIV AIDS community has been enormously successful in creating awareness about HIV and in fighting HIV. But uh, we've just heard that one in four HIV patients actually dies of tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis. So how do you fight HIV without also enlisting in the fight against TB? Well, thank you for having me here today. And the answer is, of course, you can't, and you shouldn't. Why should we be fighting one thing when we could be fighting several things together? And I'm very proud to be here today. And, you know, I want to borrow your T-shirt and wear this around the conference <laughs> because everyone knows I'm living with HIV, but they don't know anything about TB. And I think this is it. This is how we make the world a, a healthier place. We come together as communities. You know, the HIV community taught me how to overcome my own self-stigmatization with HIV and then to turn around and to believe myself that this was nothing more than a retrovirus, nothing more than a disease, that I was deserving of access to care, support, and love just like anybody else. And this is what we have to do for each other in all disease categories, all marginalized diseases, all things that people don't understand. When people understand the truth and the facts of the disease, I think we can get people to be comfortable. I think about this, you know, you go to a dinner party and maybe you have the flu and people are kind of recoiling and then you tell them you're on antibiotics and they're like drinking out of your wine glass. Well, when you're HIV positive and you're access care and treatment and you're virtually non-infectious because you've been adherent to your medication, people are le more comfortable. And I think tuberculosis is a very critical issue today that we can do the same thing with. We can evolve the conversation. We can, it's brave women like you both who are coming forward that will change the perception of the disease. And we just need the information so that we can all help each other. So the community of people with HIV is here to help you and we will learn from each other. And your magazine, your website, can they be useful in spreading the word? Well, about I'll be this? vlogging about this. And the, the magazine has always covered tuberculosis, but we will certainly do a lot of coverage during the conference and on a media panel this afternoon. I'll speak about it because it's, it's not well known enough. And I think when we come together, you know, we'll, all communities have more power when they have greater visibility and greater mass. And so all of us need to come together around the world to fight both diseases together. So thank you for your work. Regan, thank you for joining thank us you. today. Thank Thanks. And, uh, and we have a question from our audience coming in on Twitter. The question is, how can we better integrate HIV and TB services? What's the relationship between the two? We've talked a little bit how important it is. So practically speaking, where does this happen? And how? You know, I, I think the question is a relatively straightforward one, that we need to think about it from the point of view of a patient, um, not what's easiest for the health system or what's easiest for the doctors. You have to think about it from the point of view of the patient. Where many of my patients come from, to get to the clinic, they have to walk for four hours yes. over very rugged terrain. And when they show up, they have to wait in a queue, and then they have to wait in another queue. And what we do in some of the projects I work on is we go to the patients instead, because if if you're sick, you can't walk for four hours. Um, but I think always taking the perspective of the patient, I think as uh, Jerry was saying earlier, the sufferer. And so, um, I don't know, I'm sure you guys have yeah. some better thoughts than I do on that. Well, actually, the International Federation of the Red Cross, together with our volunteers across the world, um, do exactly that. We do go to the patient's home. We work together with the municipal regional clinics. We sometimes even receive the medications on behalf of a patient. Um, that is their antiretrovirals as well as their TB medications and see to it that they get to the patient's home. Um, I tell you what, what works, interestingly enough, in by default in poorer countries is the fact that there, there are not enough resources and therefore not enough health workers to, right. to be able to have a nurse, a sister or a doctor deal with only HIV uh, uh, positive patients and then only TB positive patients. So what you find is that you only have one practitioner who can deal with both. And so that's in fact how by default, just because we didn't have the resources, we had already integrated the services and therefore the HIV uh, counsellor 
also happened to be the TB counsellor. And so that's really what needs to happen is they need to be housed in one facility, they need to be working together, and they need to be cross-educated so that every one of them can in fact bring a service to, to a client. And Alice, you'd mentioned the idea of testing someone yes, like, like you test a pregnant woman for, for yeah. HIV when she comes in for a... Yeah, like I wanted to add that so. when government or health facilities are planning, they should plan for it. If you are making a budget for HIV testing machines, they should put the budget for the TB and also plan for the treatment so that people get services in the same place. I was getting my HIV treatment different, two different separate places, oh my. like HIV for, from a different health facility. And then I have different appointment days for oh. my, my drug. So it's difficult. So if we are making plans or developing budgets, should make for both. Like what we are doing in the community. I'll keep on referring to what I'm doing in the community at the grassroots. We go and to sensitize people, not only about HIV, but both disease. Like we talk about HIV and talk about TB, so that people have a clear understanding of both diseases, because they affect on the earth. Great. Oh, I want to take another uh, uh, person from our audience here who's very involved in this, Lasha Gawadze from the International Red Cross and Red Crescent, one of the sponsors of this event today. Lasha, you see the fight against TB as a basic human rights issue. Explain your point of view on that. Uh, yes, uh, Jean, definitely, uh, I agree with you. Uh, fight against tuberculosis must be based on the human rights approach because tuberculosis manifests, manifests itself where there is a neglect, illiteracy, widespread violation of the human rights. There are specific groups and settings where people are particularly vulnerable to tuberculosis. When they become sick, they are very limited in their access to the treatment. There is limitations created by stigma that sometimes kills uh, um, ad adequate information, inadequate resources to help most, most in need, and women and children are among those groups. So to be uh, more precise, it includes right to life, absolutely fundamental right of non-discrimination, right to have adequate information, right to be empowered, to be in the center, and also to feel a responsibility in fighting tuberculosis. Um, address tuberculosis and HIV together, definitely, and different um, uh, social and economic determinants to health, like housing, like poverty. Uh, so, I mean, my organization, International Federation Red Cross and Red Cross Societies, through our member uh, national societies in each country, work exactly with most disadvantaged and difficult to reach groups of the communities. Pasha, thank you. I, I feel empowered by what you said. I want to thank you. I also want to thank Carrie and Cami. Cami, we may see again. Dr. Fern, <laughs> Alice, and Jerry, all of you. Jerry will also see again for sharing their stories with us. Well, we convene our next group of guests, this message from one of the world's most famous archbishops. We need your help to get the word out and urge the world to stop tuberculosis and HIV in Africa and around the world. When people take an HIV test, they should also be checked for tuberculosis. Follow the stories of people living with HIV and tuberculosis on the 22nd July, live from Washington, D.C.
And it's so important to have the support of leaders like Desmond Tutu in this fight. Join our audience online, uh, please, by, by using the hashtag TBLive. Join me on stage once again, Jerry Elsden, the Red Cross and Red Crescent's advocate for tuberculosis. Also joining us, Natalie Nelson Skipper is an American who contracted TB while traveling overseas. And also Dr. Krishna Jaffa from Population Services International who has seen the effects of TB on women and children in India. Dr. Jaffa, we've been talking a little bit about the stigma of this disease in Africa. In India, is there a similar problem? Yes, there is, uh, Jean. I actually contracted TB when I was about 10 years old and was one of the few fortunate Indians who was diagnosed early, fully treated. It was very painful, lots of injections. But I then went on to become a medical student and saw the most horrific stigma both among medical students as well as when I started practicing clinical medicine among fellow providers and have spent the rest of my, my life trying to address and break down that stigma. Talk about this stigma among providers. Um, I presume this is because this is an airborne, easily transmissible disease and they're worried about getting infected. How do you overcome that? Well, uh, in medical school, what was very interesting was that uh, many of my fellow students opted out of that TB rotation because they were afraid of becoming infected by other HIV uh, positive as well as TB infected people. And uh, I think a lot of it had to do with ignorance as well as gaps in the training of medical students while we were still in school. Had we been given the correct information before we went out on those TB rotations, we would have been more humane, more compassionate, and been able to also protect ourselves from becoming infected. Does the problem persist or has it been somewhat overcome? It has become somewhat overcome. I think uh, public awareness is much greater, education is much greater, but then again, women pay a very, very heavy price more so than perhaps others in India. Talk about that for a bit. Well, um, like, like in Africa, women are caregivers, they're breadwinners. It's extremely difficult for women to go through a course of treatment for four to six months. And I know firsthand just how difficult that was, even in a very supportive environment. And when you look at women who have to go through those very long courses of treatment and also go out, work in the fields, take care of their children, etc., it's a very heavy burden to pay. You need to be adherent to be fully cured for TB, miss just three doses of rifampicin, and you may become uh, drug resistant. So you need to be really, really careful and have a very supportive environment. And if the first thing you encounter is your provider with a lot of stigma, that's going to make that hill so much harder to climb. Yes, and uh, just to add to that, I mean, um, I've had experiences where I've met patients who halfway through their treatment uh, were unable to get to a clinic because of, like Alice said, you have to go here for your TB treatment, there for your HIV treatment, and then a child becomes ill in your home and the caregiver had not explained that this is not an antibiotic to be used by just anyone. So the mother takes her TB treatment and gives it to the child because the child is ill, uh, because they have no means of getting any other health care. And so she defaults on a treatment in order to keep her child healthy and alive. And, um, and, and, and these are unfortunate circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so the education around TB treatment and the access to, to health education as a whole, uh, I think in certain parts of the world will make the, the largest difference to us. And I presume just the access to health care yes. itself is central to this whole issue. Yes. Indeed, and just to go back to the importance of integrating, you need to look at it from the point of view of a client, put the client first and foremost, and provide the services, not just with HIV, but also with reproductive health services. We've got this huge opportunity to reach women more effectively with TB diagnosis and treatment. We're not taking it. There's this thorny question about the stigma. It is an easily transmissible disease. How do you overcome the stigma in that circumstance? Oh, a deep have, sigh from Jerry. Well, a deep sigh because having been an advocate, um, you know, in the fight against tuberculosis for the last 13 years, it's the one thing that seems to just, it, it just doesn't go away. We've been trying to, to talk about TB um, with, as though it's as common as the common cold, and yet people just cannot perceive it in that manner. Uh, but I think it's conversations such as this. It's you meeting with ordinary people and saying, 
Oh, really? You had TB, so did I. Oh, you, you have TB at the moment, so how far along are you in your treatment? Instead of, okay, so why don't I just move over here? You know, I, I speak about being a celebrity and having other celebrity friends giving me the wide berth. I was hoping that would be 13 years ago. The fact is that people are experiencing it right now. Um, I want to go to another audience participant here, representing the World Health Organization, is Ruben Granich. Um, are you pushing to integrate the programs dealing with HIV and tuberculosis? Yes, th thanks. That's a great question, and I'm uh, honored to be here. We, we take TB very, very seriously, especially TB among people living with HIV, and we've had recommendations out since 2004 about integrating the HIV-TB uh, activities. Then why hasn't it happened? Well, it is, actually, it is happening. Uh, it's just not happening fast enough, and th these are concrete things. These are screening people for TB. These are things like putting people on isoniza preventive therapy to stop TB. These are things like earlier knowledge of your HIV status and getting on treatment, which we know reduces the risk of TB by about 65 percent. Is there resistance to the integration of these these? Well, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. Health systems are struggling. There's economic crises and these sorts of things. But um, there, there is a recognition that we will have to integrate these two uh, responses uh, basically for the same patient. And what's it going to take to move the ball forward? Well, I think we have clear, we're building momentum. We have clear, um, we have a clear set of guidelines. We have clear action. We know that what we've done since from 2005 to 2010 probably has saved about a million lives. We just need to actually double and redouble our effort. And I, I actually am confident that that's going to happen. Uh, Ruben, stay right there. Jerry, you know that the World Health Organization talks to health ministers around the world. As a citizen of South Africa, yes. what would you like to have Ruben's organization saying to health ministers? I would like health ministers to be listening to patients when they put together their programs. I would like for them to, to, to handle the problem from the perspective of the individual who is currently living with HIV or TB. Uh, policies are fantastic, but if they're not workable on the ground where you and I live, work and suffer with our HIV uh, positive status and us the stigma surrounding it as well as the TB, of what use is it to me really? So I would love to say to the World Health Organization, your next sit down with my government or any other health minister, begin to speak about how much information that we're sharing has in fact come from the client, from the patient themselves. Well, Ruben, you're right here. Can you answer the question? Well, I would say that's a great that's a great re, uh, request, and it shouldn't be that hard to actually uh, to do that with the ministries of health. And we're we're already uh, we're already working in that direction, talking about engaging communities. And and without a community response, we're really not going to beat either HIV or TB. And and we need we definitely need the communities to make that happen. Great. Thank you Thanks. so much. Appreciate it. Um, we also have in our audience a, a youth representative from South Africa uh, who suffered from TB and did a great job overcoming stigma, Hermanique Hess. Hermanique, I hope I'm saying your name correctly there. Um, how old were you when you got TB? I was seven when I had TB. I didn't know what was happening. My mother didn't know what either. Uh, it was by chance that I got injured at school. So my mother took me to the clinic. The nurse said I must have a TB test, and it became a big blister. Many people don't know the loving with TB. Many people don't know the loving with TB, and they don't take the treatment. And it doesn't only concern itself; it affects others. My concerns are: I would like. <coughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Are My you... concerns are. Many people don't know the love of TB, and many people don't take the treatment, and many people still die, and those who, die, who die are HIV negative people like myself. Thank you. And Hermity, can you tell us a little bit about your friends, how they reacted when they found out you did have TB? They were, they were just all right because I didn't want to talk with them because I didn't know exactly what, what was happening. Great. Hermanique, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, Jerry, did you have a question? Well, Hermanique is probably me at seven, except that we found my, t my TB when much I was later. much, much older. And I just want to commend her on being able to, to speak um, and to be such a strong ambassador for TB. Thank you, sweetie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Hermanique. And we also, uh, we also have in our audience Jan Beagle. Jan, or 
You there? Here we are. Jen is the Deputy Director of UN AIDS in our audience. Jen, last night you had a big celebration at the Kennedy Center all about the progress in the fight against AIDS, but there was no mention of tuberculosis in the course of that. Why not? Well, uh, to tell you the truth, why not? Uh, it should have been there, but it is there in so many other areas. It is there at the political area. We have got a declaration adopted by member states and the General Assembly with a specific goal to halve TB deaths among people living with HIV by 2015. So we're really working at the political level. We're working at the regional level. Just last week, uh, the African Union adopted a roadmap at the, at the highest level at their summit. It's an integrated roadmap for AIDS, TB and malaria. And the chairman of the AU said that this will lead to a number of African solutions, including hopefully lower costs for pharmaceuticals, which is an issue that you've raised. And then at the country level, that is extremely important, the most important, and here you're totally right. It's integration and putting people at the center of the response, and particularly women and girls. And we are really concerned to bring into the conversation those people who really know what it's about. People living with HIV, but also other groups that are more vulnerable and have difficulty in accessing services Services, such as migrant workers, indigenous people, uh, sex workers, uh, people who, who use drugs, uh, and particularly, again, women and girls who are the most vulnerable. Do you think the UN is doing enough to deal with tuberculosis at this point? I think that the UN has uh, many prongs of an approach to deal with tuberculosis. There are many in the audience here today who are working full time on this. There are others of us who have it integrated into our programs and I think that the integration is the key. Uh, putting women and children at the center is another key, making sure that we keep it on the political agenda, but also we bring innovation at the country level. And one of the issues, for example, that we're looking at is the use of mobile technology uh, for health at the country level. We're, we're looking at community providers. We're looking at peer educators, all this type of thing. So I do think that there obviously we have to uh, go further with this, but I do believe that the UN has a united approach to stopping TB. Uh, Jerry, would you agree with that? I, I do. Uh, I think what we would like to see is perhaps just a little more of, of tuberculosis in, in the language being used. I mean, I sit here and I listen to you speak and I'm, and I'm wondering when it's going to become the UNAID TB. <laughs> but, uh, but, but because the relationship is so close, because because most of our HIV uh, positive sufferers d uh, do unfortunately die from TB. Yeah. So, so I think our request would just be that, that perhaps in the language of, of UNAID that, that it just becomes a little more prominent so that, again, as I say, the language almost becomes as common as, as the common cold when, when TB is discussed and so on. Yeah. Well, I think that's a very good advice. We do have an MOU with Stop TB Partnership, and I think that we can work together to ensure that we do have that language. We do have it in many places. Perhaps if it wasn't there on one occasion, it is there. I, I would assure you on most occasions, and we just have to ensure that, that it's always there and we keep it front and center. Thank Great. you so much. Jan Beagle, thanks so much for joining us. We've talked a little bit about uh, tuberculosis in children. Here's a message from a very familiar face here in the U.S. Listen, children around the world are dying from tuberculosis. You know why that's shocking? Because 200 children every day die from a disease that is curable. Now, we all need to work together to change this. Our goal should be and must be no more children dying from TB. That, of course, the actress and talk show host Whoopi Goldberg. Um, Natalie, um, we have Whoopi Goldberg here, a very prominent voice talking about this. But from your perspective, an American who's had DP, DP, TB, do you think there's the awareness in this country that's needed about this disease? No, I, I definitely don't, and that's a great question, um, something I'm very passionate about. I am living proof um, that we need to worry about this. I went to South Africa and not only brought home tuberculosis, but brought home multi-drug resistant tuberculosis, which was very difficult to diagnose, very difficult to treat, and very costly to treat. It took away three years of my life, and so I would say this is definitely something that we need to address. Three years of your life for treatment? Three years of my life. One year to get di or one year they thought I had a stomach bug, so we I didn't have the diagnosis, and then after I was diagnosed, 
two years of treatment, and it was long and difficult. Okay, we've talked about the diagnostic issue in other environments, but to hear that the health system in the U.S is also not looking for this. Absolutely, it's not on the forefront of their minds and they were looking to anything but that because they believe it's an extinct disease here, so. But actually, Natalie brings up a very important point, is, and, and it's something, in fact, that Krishna brought up earlier. It's the training of the physician and the knowledge of the physician of tuberculosis and where it sits in their diagnosis. Um, once, it's, once it's not uh, gastritis and after it's not a tummy ulcer or colonitis or who knows what else you might diagnose, at which point does the physician, American, Indian, or African, then look for TB? I think that's an important question. Well, we have Krishna. a physician right here. Well, one of the interesting things about Natalie's story is that she had had recent exposure. She had lived in a country in which there was a very high burden of TB. This is a very interesting thing. And, and as uh, people who work in tropical medicine and infectious diseases uh, do try and practice in the US, uh, you try and look for what possible infectious exposures might have happened. So in fact, had there been a higher index of suspicion for this disease and a proper medical history, uh, then perhaps she could have been spared those three years of suffering. Uh, I only had six months taken away, but I can only imagine how difficult her journey was. And all you need to do is to listen to your client and hear their story and ask the right questions. And yes, absolutely, there's an element of training there. But think about the last time you went in to meet your physician or your healthcare provider. How much time did they give you? to listen to your story, to hear about what had happened to you. And that is at the heart of what is wrong with diagnosing and treating TB. Uh, Natalie, I think there's a, a perception in the US that our borders will protect us. They don't when it comes to <laughs> TB, do they? I'm living proof that that is not true. It doesn't, you know, what, what happens in Africa or any other country um, can affect us. If you breathe in, then you are at risk. <laughs> it's here. Um, in our audience is Christopher Benn, representing the Global Fund. For those of you who don't know, uh, the Global Fund allocates money to developing countries to fight TB, HIV, and malaria. Christopher, what proportion of your funding goes to fighting TB? Um, about uh, a quarter of our funding goes to TB. That means the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria has invested about $4 billion over the last 10 years into TB control. But it is true what uh, many of you said. Uh, it is a kind of hidden disease in a sense. There's not much kind of uh, advocacy for TB. So um, I think uh, we are able to mobilize the funding for, for tuberculosis, but we would welcome uh, more publicity around TB, that it's known that we need you know, well-financed programs, integrated programs, as you said. But we are ready to scale up our funding for TB. For us, it's a very, very important uh, topic. And we want to kind of have these combined proposals for HIV TB that can be funded, and particularly, as you just discussed, the multidrug resistant tuberculosis, because we are by far the largest funder of TB programs internationally. And uh, the multidrug resistant tuberculosis is something that we should really focus on. No, I know Jerry wants to react to what you've said. <laughs> and may I say, we are hugely appreciative for everything that you have done for us. Thank you. But we cannot advocate anymore without, without more funding. We cannot promote, nor can we, can we let, highlight and let people know unless we have the resources. And most of our resources are being used on the ground, taking care of patients. Um, and, and you know, I was, I, was, I was saying earlier on that I, um, uh, to, to the rest of the team backstage that we're not looking for you to, ex to, to fund more. We're looking for an equaling of the playing field. So we understand that perhaps the Global Fund has this much. And because of current circumstances, they cannot extend. But perhaps what you do with that um, for TB, just, just an equilibrium would give us an opportunity to do more. But let me just say, we are not pre-allocating the money. It's not that we say one quarter goes to TB or you know, half goes to TB. It depends on the, the kind of proposals we get. So we encourage you, in a sense, at the country level, uh, the community organizations, the ministries, to come up with great proposals, integrated proposals. We are willing to fund that. We are willing to put more money into TB, but the kind of allocation reflects what we get from the countries. Krishna? Okay. If I could just add a request to what uh, uh, you've just said. 
I think it would be to also not exclude reproductive health services from ways that we can reach TB patients and get them diagnosed and into care. Um, and I would also say that it would be very useful to have policymakers tell us what we can do today. It takes about 15 seconds to ask those four screening questions for TB, and yet we're not asking them at every opportunity we have. A very simple signal from many of you in this audience and listening to say, add those four questions, get them out, ask people if they're coughing, if they've lost weight, if they have a fever, if they've had night sweats. It took me all of, what, 10 seconds? You can do that right now. You don't need more money for it. Although you do need more money to provide the services and the treatment. And there is a shortfall of about $30 billion that we need to raise to address TB. $30 billion. Yes. And Christopher, is raising that kind of money <laughs> becoming more and more problematic given the global recession? Obviously, the global recession doesn't help to mobilize resources. But we have to say one thing, you know, it's just the international part that, that we are funding from the Global Fund. Most of the funding for TB comes from domestic budgets. Um, so we have to talk to the governments to increase their domestic budgets, and then we are willing to do our share and to kind of appeal to the policymakers, to those who give us the money, that we need to invest more in, in tuberculosis. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Christopher, for joining us. Appreciate it. Also in the audience here, we have Luchika Deshu, who represents the Stop TB Partnership. Luchika, you have said in the past that partnerships are absolutely key to addressing this. Are the right kind of partnerships in place now? Yes and no. Uh, what I want to clarify, and I want people from here to live with, is that a lot of progress has been made with trying to push HIV and TB together. But we have a, a huge work in front of us because we still have, as you said, 1.4 million people dying with TB. And last year, we, we did a lot of work with uh, the colleagues from UNAIDS and the WHO and showed that with the existing tools, by just simply scaling up what we have, we can save a million lives between now and 2015. I have all understanding and support for the research and development. And indeed, in TB, we are working with a diagnosis that it's old, with drugs that are 60 years old, with a vaccine that is 95 years old. But even with the tools we have right now, by simply scaling up and going from the pilot project to the full scale up, we can achieve something. But what's for that... What's the obstacle, obstacle to scaling it up? Is it political will, as was mentioned earlier? You know what I think it is? Two things. Is, is really what... Uh, I'm going to your question, the real partnership, holding hands between all of us, because what we are all dealing with is a human being who is unfortunate enough to have HIV, to have TB, to have malaria, to be a pregnant woman, to be a sex worker or a drug user. Unless we all go together and we integrate our efforts at the country level, we will not be able to push this work to happen because the, the budgets are limited. You cannot afford, as Jerry was telling us yesterday, to us to have a, a nurse dealing with ATB, another one with HIV, another one, another one with reproductive health. So it's really holding the hands together and trying to push this forward to the agenda. But the other thing we need, and I think in TB we can do much better, is to be much bold and to have better targets. And I would like the people here, we are today in the beginning of the conference uh, of, for the AIDS of 2012, that we all need to think for TB and to aim for zero TB HIV deaths. I think that those of us being last night at the Kennedy Center, we were shocked probably of the amount of politicians and leaders and community and advocates calling for the end of AIDS. I am here from the TB world and I'm kind of tired that we never called for the end of TB and we live with TB for thousands of years. People are unhappy because we have an HIV AIDS epidemic old of 30 years. And Michelle Sidibe says, in 30 years, we need to end this up. TB is with us for more than 2,000 years. We are here humble, vulnerable, shy of sharing that. I think it's time to drop that and be much bolder and call for zero TB HIV deaths. And and why do you think TB has not been embraced that way? Why have the, those targets not already been set? I think, for two, in my opinion, for two reasons. We all 
in TB are, and I think Jennifer alluded to that, a bit too medical. We are a bit too many doctors in this business. And we never really looked, and you said that uh, as well, and somebody retweeted it, at the patient and the human being that we are here to serve. In TB, traditionally, the TB patient is, because, is humble, shy, not really aware of his rights and duties, and not enough empowered to ask for that. Unless we embrace the communities and the civil society completely, truly, and genuinely into the movement for TB, we will not be there, and we will never be able to ask the TB HIV, because it will be me asking it. It should be an entire movement from the grassroots saying, we want that, because we don't want any more to have people like Hermanik and others suffering because of a disease that is curable and costs $25 for six months treatment. That's what it costs. If you get it at that point, the statistics for drug-resistant tuberculosis are quite different, are they not? Yes. And huge. Yes, and that's what, again, was mentioned here as well. That's the cost of inaction, because MDRTB is not a disease that is just uh, created by nature. We don't have spontaneous mutations creating MDRTB. MDRTB is a man-made disease. So we go from a disease that is curable, okay, it's a pain in the ass, it costs $25 for <laughs> six months, but it's curable and it's, it's, okay, it's kind of feasible to treat the people. But then if you don't have the drugs, you move to MDRTB. Here in the US, it costs 500,000 US dollar for one single patient for two years of treatment. And that's the cost of inaction. That's the cost when you create the, the, the MDRTB from a perfectly sensitive, normal TB case by simply giving not enough drugs, not the right combination, not following the patient, or not diagnosing in time the patient that he can spread around it. Luchika, thanks. Krishna, you wanted to chime in? Sure. Well, I wanted to hug Luchika for a very impassioned, <laughs> which we all do. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure the audience also feels oh, like yeah. that. <laughs> In addition to that very impassioned plea, if I could add a little bit more, I think it's, uh, it's really about emphasizing that this is a fully treatable and curable disease. And when you asked earlier about stigma, and I am happy to see you leaning forward when you've got three former TB sufferers sitting <laughs> next to you. Um, the issue is it is treatable, it is curable. We aren't getting the information out to people like this lovely audience to people who are watching us to say it's in your control. If you know the signs, if you know the symptoms, you can manage this. You have the power within you to do something about it. And we need to get that message out. And we're trying yes. here today. Yes. And joining us from Portugal now is the UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Tuberculosis, Jorge Sampaio. President Sampaio, we have heard panelists here say not enough is being done to deal with TB. What is it going to take to change the game? Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think this panel has been uh, extremely stimulating. And uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, really, uh, when I started working for the UN on this in 2006, I was amazed in, with heads of state and very relevant civil servants at the top of the administration of many countries thought that TB had disappeared. Uh, and, and, and the fact that the unknown illness, in fact, devastates in terms of human loss and, uh, and um, stigma and suffering, uh, aggravating, of course, uh, the country cap country's capability to, to work and to develop an economy, is amazing. So everything that was said is fantastic because that's get, it gets to the major points. It, it covers, as, uh, as it was said, the need for research, uh, more research, more accurate research. It covered uh, the need for uh, a quick uh, diagnosis because, of course, uh, a contagious disease of this uh, uh, capacity needs to be very quickly diagnosed. And then, of course, as the Indian uh, uh, very uh, capable doctor was saying, if MDs are not prepared to see that there are symptoms there or, or the people are not informed at the community level that someone has started coughing and someone is uh, getting thinner, et cetera, et cetera. Nothing will happen. Third, it, you need, of course, uh, health services uh, uh, in the communities and you need advocacy. 
you need advocacy by WHO, by the Global Fund. The Global Fund, by the way, uh, does in fact give grants to, for tuberculosis, but it has at the same time uh, appreciates candidatures coming from countries, to, and countries need to have their national plan. So this also means that not only at the general universal level, the United Nations purpose, the WHO, the Stop TB Partnership, the Global Fund, etc., etc. But you need a national commitment. You need national leadership. And uh, I remember and, that. And, and we how do you? In and how do you create that? How do you come up with that national leadership? Well, by precisely what you're doing today, which I think is a, an, an extremely important way of putting the community of those who have suffered, those who were ill and were cured, and to finish this extraordinary grave paradox. You die by, for an illness who is curable, and you, in fact, affect deaths to people who are on antiretrovirals with an incurable disease. So you keep them alive with ARVs, and then they die because they, have, they were not tested for tuberculosis, which is a curable disease. This paradox is the most, one of the most serious paradoxes in the world today. And if we only could devote a little bit of our attention at the scientific level, at, at the media level, it can come from anywhere. Someone traveling in a plane, and now it's getting worse because the multi-resistant uh, tuberculosis and resistant tuberculosis is a new serious threat. And after all, there are many, many well-known countries. I don't refer the names, but they are coming up in economic terms. There are everywhere high burden disease uh, tuberculosis countries. So it means that we have a lot to do. And this panel, in fact, if we should if we could sort of uh, make it repeating itself everywhere, coming up on the media in each country, helping the countries come forward with the communities and form a national plan who could present the candidate to the Global Fund with proper scientific consultation coming from WHO and coordinate and test at the same time. You Wonderful. have to test for HIV and you have to test for TB. We had a conference in 2008 in, uh, in the at the United Nations, which was called the Global Forum, the Global Leaders Forum for HIV TB, where there was a call for action to diminish both diseases at the same time. Four years have gone by. It would be interesting to have an evaluation of what has happened in this mutual and coordinated fight and see where we go from here. And I think this talk uh, is of extreme importance, but we cannot go further if we are not aware if we don't know the evidence, if we don't have everyone with us on the need to fight this uh, terrible epidemic that kills, uh, you know, uh, more than 1,500,000 1, people per day and 400 patients from HIV who die from tuberculosis. This is unbearable and it should be brought to the same precise the same panels where HIV is discussed. They cannot go separated now. We know too much in terms of scientific knowledge that to see that the combination is there. And of course, there is politics in this too. And, and the politics is, are you aware of this, gentlemen? Members of parliament, members of Congress, <clears throat> members of national assemblies, ministers, each country. Why not a little bit more for uh, health services? Why not a bit more? Just one more laboratory in a huge country. Just one. If, if you can double the capacity. And there are already um, instruments for quick uh, uh, diagnosis. And so I, I think, sorry. Uh, uh I hate to interrupt you with your passion and your good ideas, and I hope that you can take that and carry it forward and, and help everyone uh, who's been on the well, stage. We and need, we need all audience. of you. We need all of you. We definitely need all of you. This is not an isolated thing. This is a community, yes. national-based thing, too. President Sampaio, thank you so much. Thanks to President Sampaio for joining us. Thanks also to our guests here on the stage and in the audience and online. But before we end, we'd like to welcome back Cammie. Cammie, I think you're still yes. there. There you are. Did I miss anything? <laughs> oh, you missed a lot, Cammie, but oh. I'm not sure you would have loved it. Oh, okay. um, but I wanted to ask you, as a five-year-old who's HIV positive, yes. you have your life ahead of you. Oh. When it comes to HIV, 
what's your wish for the future? And Natalie, I'd love if you chimed in on this too as someone who suffered from the disease. But Cammie, why don't you go first for me? Well, I guess I wish that all children around the world would be able to get cured from HIV. And um, you know, I wear this red ribbon to remind people to support people like me who are living with HIV AIDS. But I, I wish that we did not even need to talk about this anymore. Cami, thank you. Natalie, how about you? What, what would your hope be for the future? I agree with you, Cami. Mm -hmm. I would love to see tuberculosis gain the same recognition that HIV AIDS has um, in our community. I would love to see new diagnostics, new vaccines, um, new everything. Let's get rid of the old and um, in with the new. Great. Cami, thank you very much, sweetie, well, thank for joining you. us. Thank Bring, you. Go back and keep spreading the word for us. Oh, yes, I will. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you, Natalie, and thanks to all of you who joined us here today. If you'd like to know more about what you can do to protect the vulnerable and fight the TB epidemic around the world and in the HIV-positive population, please visit www.stoptb.org or www.ifrc.org. We'll put those addresses up for you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Cammie.